Good morning, good afternoon, and good, e good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of USAID's Center for Resilience and the Global Resilience Partnership, I welcome you to Global Partnerships for Locally-Led Development. I'm Sophie Fontaine with Resilience Links. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. Firstly, if you haven't done so already, please use the chat to introduce yourself. To ask questions throughout the webinar, you can use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Feel free to upvote the questions you'd like to see answered. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust your view. Lastly, we are recording the webinar and will email you the post-event resources shortly following the event. To learn more, check out resiliencelinks.org. You can now see our agenda to, for today on your screen. Following this brief introduction, I'll pass it to Michael Coons, who will be providing some opening remarks. After that, Dr. Nathaniel Matthews, the CEO of the Global Resilience Partnership, will provide a keynote presentation on global partnerships and locally led development. Nate will then moderate a fireside chat with Dr. Shanaz Musa, Jen Abdella, and Sheila Patel. We've also reserved plenty of time for an open Q&A with all of our speakers, which will be moderated by Samantha Levine Finley. Thank you for your attendance today. I'll now pass it to Michael Coons, Senior Knowledge Management Advisor with USAID's Center for Resilience. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Sophie, and thanks to the entire team for organizing this webinar on the role of global partnerships in promoting locally-led development. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see such an impressive turnout today. As a member of the global resilience community, USAID Center for Resilience is keenly interested in sharing knowledge and learning opportunities to build resilience among households, communities, and systems. Locally led development is essential to achieve and maintain well being outcomes in the face of COVID, climate, conflict, and other significant shocks. Some of you may be familiar with USAID's resilience policy and the emphasis on supporting effective and responsive leadership at the local, national, and regional levels. Learning about locally-led initiatives gives us an opportunity to consider insights that can inform and inspire effective responses to local needs in a way that mobilizes investments in people and systems to protect and improve human well-being in the face of shocks and stresses. Today's webinar is based on the experience of the Global Resilience Partnership which is supported by USAID Feed the Future and other bilateral and multilateral institutions. Partnership represents a diverse group of organizations working together to advance resilience. Thank you to all of our speakers and everyone who helped make this webinar possible. And thanks again to everyone for joining today. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Nathaniel Matthews, who is the CEO of the Global Resilience Partnership. Thanks, Nate, and over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and just thanks again to everyone for joining today. I know there are lots of competing uh, times, virtual events going on. So we really appreciate your time. And I can promise that my presentation, which will only last a maximum of 10 minutes, will be the only one that you, you have to sit through today for this webinar. We'll be going right into a really rich discussion and then a lot of time for audience Q&A. Um, and so please do, start to think of some questions as we go through this. Uh, I'd like to first um, start, to, we can just advance the slide there, thanks. Um, really to talk and set the scene a little bit around, oh, and we can jump to the next one, thank you. Around what we're, I think, what is this setting, a scene setting for what we talk about when we when we think about partnerships, and it's it's really a recognition that we're the world is a different place than it was a hundred years ago, and so we live in an epoch now where humans are the domin dominant force of planetary change. Um, we're not a temporary disturbance, and we we shape ecolog ecological patterns and processes across most of the biosphere, and and this is really critical when we think about socioeconomic trends and how these line up as well. So well correlation does not always imply causation. We can see that with population growth, um, with uh, you know, rise in GDP, with uh, our extraction of oceans and agricultural growth and, and clearing of forests, we've got these socioeconomic trends on the left and these earth system trends on the right. And so we're really seeing that 
um, you know, the world is shaped differently now. We're, we're in a novel, uncertain world. There's lots of turbulence. And, and that really, I think, changes how we speak about partnerships and how we need to develop partnerships. It also speaks to the importance of partnerships. Because when we're recognizing that we're in a system, a hyper-connected system, where impacts, for example, like COVID that started in one part of the world and then reverberated out, go quite quickly, we need a partnership approach to, to really tackle systems, system challenges. So with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Global Resilience Partnership. We are a diverse group um, of over, as Michael mentioned, of over 65 organizations working together um, through on the ground in innovation, knowledge sharing and policy uh, engagement. And we believe that resilience underpins sustainable development in an increasingly unpredictable world. Um, and we support communities and people and places to deal with shocks, adapt to change, and to transform, and all within planetary boundaries. So we take that. A lot of people hear the word resilience um, thrown around. Now, with 65 plus organizations, you can imagine that trying to define it in, in a sentence or two is is a challenge across all the organizations. But what we like to focus on are some key attributes for resilience. And we've been working on these with our partners. So the first one, and I'll just go through these quickly, but I think that helps set up some of the frame for what we'll discuss. So the first one is diversity. And we see diversity as really providing the flexibility um, through uh, our ways, multiple ways to respond to systemic changes and shocks. Um, it helps provide sources of innovation for new conditions. And we recognize that key dimensions of diversity have been lost in our hyperconnected world. Biodiversity loss is a, is a classic example of that and its impacts it's having across uh, food systems and, and of course with, for example, disease. Um, the next one, redundancy. And this works quite closely with redundancy, oh sorry, with diversity, but it really ensures again these multiple ways to secure critical functions in a system, almost like an insurance policy. And I think it's that need for redundancy, which is almost the sort of flip side of over the last many years, we, we focus so heavily, heavily on efficiency, but actually now I think within our hyper-connected world, the need for redundancy and, and securing multiple ways is, is really important, especially when we're dealing with so much uncertainty. Uh, the next one is connectivity. Uh, and this, I think, requires careful management. So when we think about connectivity, it's sort of a dual-edged sword. For example, we've seen that um, shocks and stresses can spread very, very quickly across the globe. Uh, of course, with the war in Ukraine right now, we know we're going to have some significant food shocks as a result of that in our, our hyper-connected society. But also, connectivity can help us share uh, information very quickly, and it can really help partnerships also be more effective. So there's that dual-edged sword that we have to balance within connectivity. Next one around um, inclusivity and equity. And this is just a, a fact that we know a resilient system is inclusive and equitable. And inclusive participation is critical for building trust and facilitating collective action and really enabling us to respond to volatility and change. And we also know that more equal societies in terms of human development, income, access to resources are less prone to instability and conflict. But unfortunately, um, inequalities across a number of dimensions are on the rise worldwide. And the last one I wanted to flag here as a key attribute is adaptive learning. And this is really the ability to detect changes, both slow and quick changes, and learn from them and tailor management strategies and response structures that you know move away from these sort of top-down approaches and short-term cycles to a longer um, feedback loops around how we can effectively deal with the interlocking and complex dynamics of multi-system shocks. So we really see these five attributes as, as really critical for thinking about resilience, especially in the Anthropocene, in a, in a hyper-connected and a very uncertain world. So just to talk very briefly now through a little bit of GRP, as I mentioned, we're uh, about 65 partners. Um, I just pull this up here as just a little bit of a flash. As you can see, the diversity of partners, we work with community organizations, governments, 
private sector, think tanks, uh, multilateral organizations. And, and really what we're what is key to this partnership is that we're bounded by uh, a mutuality, a, a common understanding of the challenge. I think that's important. The second key component of GRP is that we really work on, on sustained activity. So we're, we're trying to build engagement together. We consider our partners, all of our partners as active partners. And uh, we really work to ensure that, that we add up to more than the sum of our parts. And finally, that we are achieving impact. And I think this is really critical. So we want to see the results of our efforts. And that's what binds us together and really helps us be effective um, building resilience. And then just to take it a little bit more um, real, so you see lots of logos there, but also I wanted to highlight a bit of our secretariat. We keep our secretariat um, quite lean, and I'm hoping that, there we go, wonderful. So we've got the secretariat there. Um, we're based uh, in South Africa, Kenya, uh, India, um, Sweden, the UK, um, so in the Netherlands, a bit all over the place, but really working again on a very lean secretariat and a, and a really strong advisory council as well from across the partnership um, to help pull this together. And, and then just moving along, um, I wanted to talk a little bit very briefly for a minute here just about the work that we do. So we work across four interlinked areas. So it's just very simply innovate, share, shape, and advance. So in our innovate work, that's our work on the ground where we're really helping to support projects through grant funding, um, through uh, innovation support to, to really build resilience on the ground. Um, we have work um, which will be highlighted a bit today, uh, for example, by Jen. Um, but we also do, so that's supporting entrepreneurs and enterprise um, in Sudan. Um, we have work supporting uh, road systems. We've done work supporting coastal communities, um, work on financial tools. So really a diverse set of work on the ground and that we're really proud of and that we continue to, to engage in and really um, support our partners to do. Then jumping over just to the right there in terms of sharing, we also really focus on promoting shared learning on the latest resilience knowledge, practice and measurement. Um, and I think this is really critical because we have to learn from the successes of resilience um, building, but we also have to learn from those mistakes which are really rarely talked about. Um, so we have something called the Resilience Knowledge Coalition that we work on with CDKN, the Climate Development Knowledge Network, and the International Center for Climate Change and Development. And that's much bigger than just the partnership. So it's got over 400 members and we're really designing, we've designed that as a, as a key opportunity to share. And over the next 18 months, we'll be focusing a lot on advancing resilience measurement. Um, so if you're not uh, signed up to that, I would really encourage you to, to check on our website and, and do sign up to the Resilience Knowledge Coalition. So there'll be lots of opportunities there um, to engage. Then looking down to the shape component, that's where we really focus on our, on our policy engagement and where we're trying to um, shape investment and policy. And so we engage a lot at the COP process, for example, a lot at regional climate weeks. We co-chair the Climate Resilience Pathway of the Marrakesh Partnership. And we also do a lot of work at community events like the community-based adaptation event, um, recently at Govashona and, and other key uh, events where we can help elevate voices and, and ensure that our partners are, are really influencing and shaping policy. And then finally, in the advanced space, this is where we're really connecting and supporting communities and practitioners to advance resilience research and thinking. Um, and this includes uh, components like our South to South Resilience Academies, which support thought leaders from the Global South to advance their solutions to resilient building on the ground, which instead of them always coming from the Global North, and, and also supporting ideas like the Voices from the Frontline, which we do with um, the Climate Development Knowledge Network and the International Center for Climate Change and Development as well, so collecting stories from communities on what works and what doesn't in terms of resilience building. Uh, so that's a little bit of a highlight across those four areas. There's a lot more depth um, behind what I just, uh, my, my whistle stop tour, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look at our website and, and see what else is there. 
And then just moving along, uh, I would just like to say uh, thank you to uh, all of you again for coming. Uh, really looking forward to a rich discussion, and I wanted to take you through these slides pretty briefly before we get to what I think will be um, a, a great discussion and a lot of time for audience Q&A. So, great. I, I would now, I think I can jump right in to introducing our speakers. So, I am joined today um, by three um, resilience leaders that I certainly look up to uh, in, in, in the resilience world. And uh, I really feel like I, um, I can just uh, not really say much because I think they all have so much to share. Uh, so first we have um, Dr. Shanaz Musa, who's the Director of um, the Climate Development Knowledge Network and South South North which is an organization that we work very closely with in GRP. Um, Sheila Patel, who's the director for the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Center, and is uh, also the founder of that, and also the founder, or one of the founders of Shackfellers International. And Jen Abella, who is the program director of climate resilience, uh, climate resilient development at the Near East Foundation. And so GR, these are all three um, key partners for GRP, people that we've worked with and uh, really excited about this chat. And, and as I said, please do start to think of some questions that um, for Shanaz, Sheila and Jen, um, because we will have a, a, a long interactive session coming up. Great, so I can see you all now, which is wonderful. Um, and Shanaz, I might start with you, uh, if that's all right. And, I, you know, we're talking today about global partnerships. And, and when people often think about global partnerships, they, they tend to jump, you know, in some cases to north to south partnerships or south to north partnerships. But, you know, obviously you work for um, the foundation South South North and south to south partnerships are also, you know, really key to realizing impact. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that and, and how you've seen things develop, um, you know, over the last few years as well. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. And yes, I, I mean, firstly, actually, it's an honor to be here on this platform and talking and being with Sheila. I mean, Sheila is actually an old friend also by now. So I do love sharing a platform with her and also with Jen. I've never shared a platform with Jen, but I'm looking forward to it. So, yes, definitely, South-South partnerships, or what I like to call vertical partnerships, are essential to realizing impact and grounded impact. Um, to bring this across, I'd like to use an example where they were both vertical, which is your South-South, as well as North-South or horizontal partnerships, and where the impact has been significant. So one of our projects, Voices from the Frontline of COVID-19, was quite a global partnership. It was between the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, the International Center for Climate Change, and the Global Resilience Partnership. And the aim was to capture the hopes, fears, and everyday coping strategies, and longer-term aspiration and actions for resilience and well-being of communities across Asia and the Pacific, Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. The project captured more than 50 stories and there were hundreds of contributing voices. What came out very strongly from these stories is that the challenges are great. I think we all know this, particularly in low income communities and informal settlements where development infrastructure and services are already weak. And this is before the pandemic hit and even before there's any climate, in, climate issues there. The most economically and social, socially vulnerable have been worse affected and will be worse affected. And what we found in this study was that people self-organized and they form partnerships to help themselves and support the most vulnerable. And I think it's important to look here at how organically these partnerships were formed. And these are 
your vertical partnerships. Such spontaneous community organizing and partnership forming is proving to be a crucial element in navigating this exceptional disruption that was COVID and that will be the climate emergency. What these partnerships allowed for were for women and young people's leadership to come to the fore, and it was outstanding. Further, these partnerships have drawn on and they were strengthening existing relationships, which were information networks, group savings, markets, and income generating opportunities. And these partnerships even created new ones. So moving beyond the community partnerships, people in these low income communities clearly articulated that they would like to partner with governments and external actors to improve their situation. And I think this is where the, the partnerships grow and it, 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 and it becomes more not of the usual, but more unusual partnerships, which then lead to real impact. So I think there is most definitely a recognition that partnerships lead to, will lead to positive climate action and that the, these partnerships need to be built on trust and inclusivity. And I think this clearly came out from this project of, and the 50 stories, particularly around inclusivity and trust. I think with that, Nate, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Shanaz. And yeah, I'd like to pick up on, on some of those points a bit more here in a moment. But um, just before we do that, I'd, I'd like to hear also from Sheila and Jen. And Sheila, if I could, if I could turn to you, you know, I, I kind of outlined in the beginning this sort of framing about a, you know, a, a different world we're in and, and the importance of partnerships. But we know that you know, a lot of the global architecture for partnerships and development is is set up in a certain way that doesn't obviously doesn't always uh, enable partnerships to happen. So, I know you've you've spent many years working um, at at a number of levels, and it would be great to hear what you think needs you know to be in place for for partnerships to to be effective, and and what also needs to change. What are the sort of roadblocks that we're seeing as well? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, so let me quickly tell you that I started this organization in Dubai as an experiment to look at how professionals could work in serious partnerships with people's movements. And at that time in the 1970s and 80s, there were evictions in informal settlements all over India, but a lot in Mumbai where I live. And by the way, all my work and all the stuff I do is in cities with informal settlements. And what we realized is that the conventional project mode done by NGOs, picking up one thing and trying to solve the problem was just dysfunctional in an environment in which the regulatory frameworks, the planning frameworks, the resource provision frameworks had produced already 40 years ago, three to four generations of really, really impoverished communities living informally. We didn't know anything about climate, but we used to do a lot of fighting with environmentalists who used to say that poor people come and mess up cities and uh, they, they'd kill the flora and the fauna and they defecate everywhere, not acknowledging that the city wasn't organized to anticipate that such people were coming. So the long and short of it is, we developed a partnership and in India itself, we work with almost 750,000 households in 60 cities in nine states. That sounds like a big number, but it's very small in relationship to the country. But what we realized is that there are lots of things that poor people can do themselves, but there are many things that require state and national frameworks within which people can get organized. If those frameworks don't exist, or even if they exist and they are not utilized, then whatever people do gets eroded and it gets destroyed. 
And for most of the last three decades, we have been working to produce evidence by communities aggregated at large levels like we have spoken about in order to tell our governments that they need to change policies, practice, allocations in order to produce solutions that work for the bottom 40% in the city. And we are unusual in the fact that although mayors in the city start our evictions, we try very hard to be their friends. And we try to explain to them that there is value and a win-win situation if you work with us, because what you do with us is also good for the city. And that's been our mantra in many ways in all our relationships. Uh, we have, a, you know, our, uh, the founder of the whole network uh, was Joe Kim. He died three years ago. And he, his, his message to all of us is that your worst enemy should become your best friend in three to five years. Otherwise, you don't have a good strategy. So we then shared this with many other communities all around the world who were facing evictions. And this produced what we called a federation model, where in 33 countries today, all over Asia, Africa, and Latin America, we are members of this transnational network called Shack Dwellers International. So we work individually, we work in neighborhoods, we work in cities, we work in countries, we work in regions, and we work globally. And this design is developed in a way that builds the capacity of communities and the professionals that work, including myself, to be able to have dialogue, discussions, to be able to challenge what is happening in different ways in order to produce solutions that are sustainable, that work for the poor, and that are based on the foundation of social justice. And until five years ago, we were not in this climate space at all. Uh, we felt that there was a hierarchy. Oh, first we must get uh, land tenure, we must get security, we must build our housing, we must get neighbors. And now we've suddenly come to the point that we don't have to change anything we do. We just have to change the lens of how we look at our own development work. And it has transformed the way our communities and our networks look at everything that they do. And they have done very interesting things. They've begun to realize that they are really the front runners. And now COVID has proved that, that when there's a crisis, there's a problem, people solve the problem to the extent they can. And that's the time when the city, the state has to kick in. And if it doesn't, then it erodes all this process that they have begun to build. The second thing we feel is that this whole architecture of no, of something being decided in Washington, London, or somewhere else is applicable to every single informal settlement across the world. It's a very dysfunctional and what we call 19th century concept. Because in reality, everything local has different nuances. Therefore, while the principles are the same, the practice is defined by local realities, local solutions, local participation. And therefore, we need a new architecture, which we are all working hard with you in GRP, now that we are members of GRP and with other organizations, in a dialogue and in, in a sort of a, a, a challenging way to say that the new global must emerge from multiplicities of local. And that at every level, we need to be part of the transformation process. We're saying that, you know, there's a there's an old saying amongst grassroots networks saying nothing about us without us. You can't talk about slum dwellers if you don't have a slum dweller sitting in front of you telling you that this constituency can use this, can't use this, this is what it is. And we have succeeded in some instances, and we have failed terribly in others. And that's as much to do with our own inability to cope with this, but it's also as much to do with the inability of very senior people to not see terrible risks in talking to poor communities. And that's one of the messages I want to give today. You cannot have local adaptation function 
if you don't trust the judgment of people who will take serious decisions in relationship to their own lives. They have a lot at stake. So the process of examining the knowledge on which people make choices, helping them look at new knowledge and weighing how it deals with everything else, whether it's affordable, whether it's doable, will produce the foundation of development which has deep climate adaptation roots and that is sustainable. Because what is resilience after all? It means whatever you do in a crisis is not finished and you go back to square one, but that you develop mobility and transformation as you move along and that you are not in the same space you were 35 years ago, which is the situation with a lot of people. And poverty in the world is increasing in a terrible way, even without the war, and now it's going to get worse. So I'll stop there, but I, what I want to say is, I want to tell people who are in philanthropy, in government, in international assistance, don't be fearful of getting a people's representative in your discussion group. We make terrific partners. We'll tell you right in the beginning if your strategy is going to work or not. And if it works, it will work across. And that's the value of social movements. And one of the things we're doing is to get both urban and rural social movements to learn from each other. A lot of it is using some of the strategies that Shanaz has spoken about. But the whole process depends upon our ability to articulate what works for us, what we aspire to do, what contributions we make. But we have the same demands and expectations of our partners. You can't say, terrific, you people are so self-reliant. No, 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 we don't want that. We want partnerships for change. And I think the whole local adaptation space has huge potential. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. That's a great, um, great intervention as well. And, and lots of um, synergies with what Shanaz was saying around the importance of, of trust and, and, and also some of the challenges there. But Jen, passing it on next to you, I, mean, I th think Sheila mentioned some about this, uh, you know, the, the urban-rural connection as well. And I know we're doing some, some work on, um, in Sudan on, on non-timber um, non forest products. But Near East Foundation has a, has a really broad experience, as do you, working uh, you know, on the ground, building partnerships, and, and also supporting uh, entrepreneurs and, and people on the ground to, to build resilience. And so could you give us a little bit of a flavor of what you found as really key to establishing these effective partnerships? Thanks, Nate. Um, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time uh, and, and letting me be here to share with you and with this fantastic panel um, and GRP as well. And um, you'll probably hear some echoes from what Shanaz and Sheila have shared, because I think um, we think in some ways along the same lines. And, and as I was listening uh, to Shanaz and, and Sheila and Nate to your presentation, thinking about, you know, what is resilience about, but knowing and understanding that people don't really experience shocks and stresses in these silos. And, and so we have to break out of siloed thinking. And that's where the partnership uh, idea can can have a lot of power. Um, and and so our solutions need to not be siloed. Um, for us, I think really at the Near East Foundation, we really um, feel there's a few key principles. One is, of course, understanding context and having a strong relationship with the communities where we work. Um, so having dialogue with the communities and partners at different levels, both along those sort of vertical levels that Shanaz was talking about and horizontally within the community across different different sectors. Um, uh, and making sure then that whatever intervention we're coming up with is actually meeting a demand and priority within that community. Um, so, so designing those partnerships in response to needs and picking the right partners and recognizing um, that we at the Near East Foundation do not have all of the capacities covered. In some cases, uh, there is a better option than us um, or a more sustainable option or a more inclusive option and, and sort of framing that in our program design 
all the way through to the end of, of program, you know, learning and, and reintegrating that learning. Um, and I think really critically then meeting our partners where they are. So in some cases, we'll have a partner who has a capacity we don't have or a perspective we don't have. Um, but really then working with those partners around capacity building and strengthening and um, uh, sort of recognizing value added um, and, and being open to the idea that that partnership is likely to change over time. Um, so for us, you know, thinking about what does resilience look like, we, we think resilient communities are those that have strong institutions, that have strong networks, um, that have capacities and assets, and that are able to take learning and reintegrate it into their thinking processes um, and, and adaptive management, just as you were saying. And I think um, then when we think about what are those partners, then we're looking across those those sort of core capacities and those core elements of resilience. So do we have a government partner? Do we have a local entity that we can embed our our um, our programming in uh, or work hand in hand with so that that we're not working in isolation and, and sort of avoiding that model that Sheila said has, has led to so many failures where a project comes in for two years and then goes away and um, doesn't have that sort of sustainable anchor. Um, and then thinking about the horizontal networks that Shanaz was talking about. And so that may be forming cooperatives. It may be organizing uh, folks. It may also just be working with civil society or um, private sector partners, um, universities, governments that are already existing and, and convening folks. Um, and then, of course, technical capacities and, and uh, learning that covers um, uh, universities, think tanks, uh, private sector, recognizing sources of knowledge may not be the traditional ones that we think of, but also being open to local knowledge and local strategies um, and creating creating that architecture where all of those ideas can surface, where we can scale the solutions that really um, make sense for a community and um, and then figuring out how to channel resources. So that last critical partnership is finding the resources and identifying how we can make sure resources get to the communities that need them the most. Um, and the work we're doing together in Sudan, of course, hits on so many of those things because we're working in that context with local cooperatives, we're working with, with local civil society, we're working with um, private sector off takers um, in the non-timber forest product sector. Uh, we're working with um, different donors. We've just begun a partnership with GRP to help scale this uh, this uh, that is working, um, bringing bringing uh, climate finance to non-timber forest product uh, producers. So um, it really is an all of the above strategy. And I think that that's when we think about partnerships, it really requires us in the international NGO community to be open uh and and to proceed with the idea that we need to work together a, across these functional areas break down the silos have a little bit of humility in terms of what we our own organization will do um and how we can work together for what really makes the most sense for the communities on the ground thanks jen uh Great as well. It's, it's so great to hear from all three of you on these. I just have one additional question that I'd like to, to throw out, and it, it relates to my experience and, and maybe what others your, yourselves saw at the last COP. And, and so last year we started to see a lot of, you know, what we'd say climate impacts hitting all over the world. And so that idea that, you know, climate impacts were something we had to deal with in the future changed to much more, you know, for, for more people, something that we had to deal with now. Now, lots of people were already dealing significantly with climate impacts before that, but it was starting to hit elsewhere. And with that came a really renewed, or I guess I should say a new interest from the private sector on how to be involved. Um, at, the, at the COP, we were seeing a lot of big companies come in and not just looking at the race to zero and, and trying to reduce um, emissions, but really interested in resilience and, and adaptation. And I guess, so my question for all three of you is, you know, where do you see the entry points or the opportunities you know, for the private sector um, to come in or, or do you, you know, or 
perhaps you don't see them, but it would be great to hear just some, some reflections. Um, and I could start, uh, maybe I'll start where I, where I began last time. Shanaz? <laughs> Thank you, Nate. I'm just here. <laughs> I needed some time to think about that. But, uh, I mean, often when we think of the private sector, it's in terms of and, and around the microfinancing and the lending and so. So I think there's an entry point there. But I think also often if we talk about the private sector, we, we also need to consider the small, small businesses. So the small women-owned businesses that need to, where their resilience need to be, needs to be built, et cetera. And I think those, but there, it's more around providing them with the, when I think of the small, small private sector type um, activities, is providing them with the means to build their resilience to keep going. So I think there's two things here. I think what I'm saying is, is the entry point in the lending and the financing side. So they could come in as, I mean, investments could be de-risked by the climate finance and then the private sector can then fund or finance based on that. And then the very small community little businesses that need where their resilience needs to be built. So working with them to do that. That's great. Thanks, Naz. And, and Sheila, I, I should also have said at the beginning, thanks for joining us so late. I know you're in Vietnam at the moment, so it's quite late in the day <laughs> for you, but really appreciate that you, you're coming fine. in. So, um, but any thoughts from, from your side? Because you're also working uh, I'll, I'll, on the stage too. I'll give two examples. Uh, one of them is, uh, is a, so first of all, we have a, within STI, we have a program called What Women Want. We're trying to say that it's not just global people and researchers who define what needs to be done locally. We say that if we start with what poor community women who are leaders in their neighborhood, what they want, we can build a ladder which is both horizontal and vertical to look at what happens. And we have five or six different asks that are STI wide. And I'll give you two examples of them which we are developing. The first one is called Roof Over Our Heads. What has happened, you know, in the situation that you're talking about, that climate change is here and now, and not 10 years later, is that people are finding that unnaturally, un sudden, unanticipated rains are producing floods because the volume of water that comes into their process is unbelievable. And they don't know what to do because it's not anticipated, the city doesn't know it, and so, you have disasters. But they're also saying that there are challenges of what all the climate processes, heat, water, uh, uh, mudslides, all these kind of things, wind, are doing to their informal homes. You know, there are over 2 billion people today worldwide who are living in formal dwellings that they have constructed, financed, and designed. And they try to imitate the formal institution, yet most of their homes at best have asbestos or tin roofs. And these fly away in these winds and they will leak in the rain. So one of the things that we are trying to do is we are trying to say what are the things communities can do? What are the things cities can do in terms of policies and support? And how can we bring the private sector in to look at the materials that need to replace what people use right now and to examine the potential of volumes of the number, you know, like right now, uh, we're talking to people who produce the tin roofs. And we're saying, look at the volume of your product that is being used by slum dwellers. Look at the plastic sheets that I use. So plastic industry, tin industry, paint industry. Now we've been told that there are certain paints in the world which if you paint the roof with that, the heat inside the home is reduced by three to five degrees. And it transforms the lives of these people if you do that. Same thing with, uh, with fire resistant materials because in slums when one home catches fire 
it takes minutes for the whole settlement to burn out. So we're looking at the materials that people use and we're looking at the industry associations nationally and globally to say, don't treat this as your socially, uh, you know, it's not your CSR, it's not your, something you're doing in charity. Look at it as business. Look at it as something that you will produce for this market, which has huge volumes, but the price range is there like this. And it contributes to a transformed quality of life. And it's very interesting to look at the kind of interest. People haven't said, yes, we'll do it tomorrow, but they say, yes, explain to us. Give us numbers. Give us volumes. Explain to us. Things like that. So my, and that's one. The second thing is very interesting of what's happening in the transport sector. You know that most poor people use whole form of illegal and informal transport mechanisms. And in most cases, these are either vehicles or things that are not permitted because of how much, uh, how, you know, what, how much carbon they produce and stuff like that. But the thing which people in the transport industry explain to us is that for every vehicle, there are six mechanics working informally that do things to keep these, these uh, vehicles running. And so if you are thinking of a whole new system of, of uh, reducing carbon emissions in, in, in transport, then if you ignore this particular sector and their needs, because poor people only have access to this, more and more uh, uh, poor people in cities, if they don't have good quality and reasonably priced transport, their, their whole incomes go down. And so when sustainable transport is discussed, there are so many dimensions to it which communities have identified. And now we're looking at ways by which we can talk to the transport planning systems nationally and locally to say, don't just produce transport to make people who are rich with cars to come into trains so that they become so sanitized and expensive that they are not affordable to poor people, but produce a whole range of things that will work for the communities. And these are issues in which poor women are actively involved in the dialogue and the negotiation locally. And we are now looking at our networks through the Race to Resilience, through GRP, and to all the other networks we are part of to try and make this something that becomes accounted for, which is a reference point, and that we can challenge if we know that that's not happening. So I think that uh, you know these kind of networks help us educate the potential value of the noise that we can make and the solutions that we can find. Thank you, Sheila. That's fantastic. Uh, really great examples. And Jen, if I can now pass over to you to wrap us up with a couple thoughts. Absolutely. And I will, um, I think there's essentially, well, I'm sure there's more, but there are three that immediately come to mind in terms of what the private sector can engage on, really on the adaptation side. And in some cases, there's mitigation potential for some of these as well. Um, one is uh, innovations, of course, and we see it all the time in terms of uh, bringing innovations to market in, in um, markets that maybe have been neglected because they're remote or they are viewed as being primarily people who are poor. Um, but, but there is an important role um, for partnerships um, with those communities that bring those communities along and see livelihood potentials in bringing those technologies uh, to local communities. Um, and that could be uh, agricultural technologies, renewable energy, um, water systems, lots of different options. Um, but that's a, certainly one place where the private sector has done well in some cases, and probably there's pretty big gaps in others where we could see um, more direct benefit to the communities in terms of livelihood support. Um, 
as well as sort of market entry for those those uh, technologies. The other is in value chains, um, where where there are global value chains, really being sure that that local producers are not trapped in the sort of bottom sections, <laughs> the bottom sort of positions of the value chains, where profits are low, where there there's exploitative conditions, um, and where they kind of are left holding the bag in terms of climate risk because if sort of the uh, production systems are not adaptive, um, maybe that global supply chain is going to shift to a different location where they can source that same agricultural product from a different um, from a different production market. But then the people who are there are just left, you know, without having gotten really much um, in terms of profit from the value chain in the first place, and 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 they they're left without any diversification in their livelihoods. So I think responsible value chain um, and and sort of resilience measures within value chains is a pretty critical piece, and it's a place where where um, there can be joint investment from the private sector in terms of improving quality and products within that value chain to the benefit of that that sort of off taker. Um, it also can be a place where there's room for philanthropic investment or, um, you know, lots of, of uh, private sector folks have, have got their investments they make in communities and being intentional about what that looks like uh, can be important. Um, and then finally, um, just recognizing that these are communities that merit investment and sometimes the risks don't, uh, are not actually as high as, um, as it might seem, and and thinking about where um, where private sector investment can make a difference in in the livelihoods of of frontline communities, um, and and investing in those um, MSMEs or agribusinesses uh, through through loans or other finance that doesn't just keep continuously creating a dependency that's undermining the resilience of those communities. Thank you, Jen, that's great, excellent. Yeah, I think that point on risk is is a really key one as well. Um, so understanding these aren't as risky as they may be perceived um, in terms of, so that's great. We want to keep time now for our audience discussion. I know that questions have been flying in um, fast, so that's wonderful. So we'll have to try to keep our, our answers quite succinct, but it's great to see that level of interest. So I'll now pass it over to Samantha um, Levine Finley. Uh, Samantha, please take us away. Thanks so much, Nate. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Samantha Levine Finley. I'm the Senior Learning Advisor on the Knowledge Data Learning and Training, or KDLT, activity that supports these Resilience Links webinars. We do have wonderful questions that have come in from the chat. Um, we're going to get to as many of them as we can. We've got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to ask our speakers to be concise with their responses. So our first question is actually for you, Nate. And the question comes from Andre Nunes, who asks, um, is the GRP working with Caribbean countries on connectivity and adaptive learning? If yes, are there any lessons or takeaways from that work? Thanks. It's uh, a good question. So. Uh, the majority of our work to date has been focused on Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, but um, a few years ago we began working and, and co-hosting the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance, or ORA as it's called, and, and through or with in partnership with ORA, um, we have been working in Caribbean countries. And, and I think the really the lessons that we're seeing there is, so we'll, to start with, there's a, there's a shared um, understanding risk when we're talking about climate risk. I mean, I think there's about 15 million liters of water flooding from the Arctic into the sea right now uh, every second. Um, so the sea level rise, the impacts of, of storm surges, of extreme weather um, are hitting Caribbean, Pacific, and, and well, small island developing states and coastal communities uh, very hard and, and will continue to significantly impact them. Uh, so in, in terms of lessons and I guess that adaptive learning, I think it, it's really, we're seeing a lot more sharing across these small island developing states and these, these coastal communities 
on, on what works and what doesn't in resilience building, and, and nature-based solutions seem to be one of the, the key takeaways from that. They, they tend, and I don't like to use the word lightly, but they tend to be a bit of a silver bullet um, when we look at, for example, mangrove restoration, protecting coral reefs, um, you know, both uh, after storm surges to ensure they get cleaned up well, and then really finding, you know, ways where financial tools can help support those, those investments in nature-based solutions. And we're seeing a lot of interest from the private sector and others, both in terms of blended finance and also in, in pure private sector finance for that. So I would encourage you to take a look at the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance website if you'd like some more information on that book. And we also have some really interesting reports that GRP did on um, the gender dimensions of, of climate change for SIDS and LDCs. Thank you so much, Nate. And I will point out that your colleague Ida did put a link um, to the Ocean Risk Alliance organization in the chat. So please feel free to click on that if you'd like to read more. Our next question comes from Paul Miller, and this is to Shanaz. Here's the question. Many would say the current aid system and projects including grants and finance for climate adaptation, are particularly ill-suited to engaging social movements and allowing the participation, which leads to better outcomes. What two to three things need to change? Over to you, Shanaz. Um, thank you. So I think it is quite, I mean, it's completely spot on that, that, that the current system of how grants and funding works is very much a top-down approach, and often it's not responding to a clear need from your communities. I think what needs to change, and it's quite a big thing, and I'm not sure, <laughs> actually, I'm just gonna say, uh, yeah, is that donors need to respond to demand and co-create the solutions rather than coming in and saying here's funding for x y and z they need to work quite closely with communities who are impacted and and actually ascertain what it is that these communities need and then respond to that and i think with that a movement will also be built because the communities will then have a voice and articulate what their need is, and then donors can respond to that. Yeah, I think it is quite a difficult question, and I don't think, but but I I, I feel that is the way, because I don't think we can move away from, we, or like we won't be able to move to a situation where adaptation actions are not funded, is not funded it's always going to have to be funded. And it's more about what gets funded and how. So, I, so, so like I said, I think it's in that co-creating how it's funded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shanaz. And these questions are fantastic. Our next question is for Jan Abdella. And the question is, when coordinating across NGOs, how can we avoid extractive practices? Yeah, I think this is from the comment in the chat, which I found to be really an important one. Um, and I think there's a risk as we all shift into a very consultative, or not shift, I think a lot of our organizations have been doing it for a long time, but as there's a recognition for this consultation and locally led programming, that um, that it, it does become extractive. And uh, that is really a counterproductive um uh status and and one that i mean either either locally led programming becomes performative and not really real um or um or we're extracting ideas and solutions without really crediting the communities where they're coming from and we're burdening those communities with the constant you know surveys and asking and data collection and all the pieces that come with it so i think um all of which are bad outcomes. I think there's a role for donors here to be aware of what are the data that are available and, and what are the plans that are available that exist already. In some cases, there's a requirement to access funding that you also do a needs assessment or a, um, or a market assessment or an, uh, some sort of consultation. And that's great, that's, that's fantastic, but if it's already been done and we could start somewhere else, um, that can become 
burdensome for the communities. It also creates expectations within the communities that then if you're not funded, all of that information, just all that time and investment kind of goes away. Um, so I think I think it does in some ways require some coordination that's beyond the sort of NGO level um, and some some sort of forward thinking. The other thing that I would say is that then in our programming where we bear responsibility as an NGO um, is back to the partnership idea. Who are we partnered with and how do we anchor what's coming out of these these uh, programs into the communities? And so if we are doing um, local development planning, are we making sure there's a process for integrating um, integrating the the thinking that's coming out of those working hand in hand with local authorities so that that shows up in a local development plan that is that is um, codified beyond our program and making sure that those those um, coordination documents exist at, not with us as as NEF but with the local community and that they then are empowered uh, to coordinate to coordinate um, the next actors that come through. But I think it's going to require a real shift from business as usual as we've been doing it. And I think I think we all have a responsibility within that. Thank you very much, Jen, for those recommendations. It's a lot of food for thought. Our next question comes from Stephen Bright Sakwa, who asks Sheila, trust is one of the biggest challenges to building partnerships, especially when people don't trust their governments. How can we go about this? Nice question. Uh, I think that uh, if you break down what constitutes trust, uh, first of all, it's an investment that requires a lot of work, but has long-term dividends. And so one of the first things I want to say before I go into specifics is that one of the challenges of the entire development spectrum of financing is that there is too much discontinuity of everything. So for trust to be formed, you have to do something together more than once in order to be able to appreciate what can be done by, you know, we say communities do a lot of things. How, how is that going to be demonstrated if it doesn't have an opportunity? It's never going to be perfect the first time. Do you have the courage to say these things go wrong? You have to change it. Or are you quickly going to say, oh, this is terrible for our reputation, we have to run away from it. So what we do is we find that as a global network, we find that our volume is one of the most important ways to manage risks. Because what we do is, if any, any city or any uh, country or any group gets resources to do something, the whole network is there to say, you need to do this, why don't you do this? We have resources that allow communities that have already done something to come. We also have, we've also convinced many of our donors to give us resources that allow slum dwellers to invite their officials to go with them to another city to negotiate and support the exploration of a similar strategy there. So what we're trying to say is that just as in the professional world, we meet each other, we network, we have long-term relationships, these have to go across the, the, this vertical hierarchy, which is so, so one way. And so uh, there are lots of experiences in which these trust processes have breached conventional procurement systems that seem to be ironclad in order to produce solutions that could be scaled up through that partnership. And partnerships don't come easily. And I think that's the real challenge, that uh, nobody has time to, to give opportunity, learn from failures, and change. And that most communities are organized by professionals, so they don't leave any legacy of leadership and, uh, and collectivity together. And so I'd also like uh, if, uh, if whoever's putting stuff into the chat could also put the, look, the principles for locally led adaptation because these are the things that many of us have compiled on the basis of what will produce sustainable, investable,
programs and produce partnerships that are long term. And I think we have eight principles that cover this and it will be very interesting for uh, the audience to look at them if you haven't and, um, and, and explore it because that's, that's at the heart, the, the risk, the trust, uh, the acceptance that you all make, we all make mistakes, but the mistakes of poor people, are, they get beaten up by that. But if the risk, if the mistake is made by professionals or researchers, then somehow they get explained and legitimated because something was wrong somewhere else. But poor people are always reminded that you did this wrong. This much money was not accounted for or something happened that was wrong. So the reputational process of holding that accountability is just thrust on the local communities of the poor. And I think there's a lot of conversation to be had on this subject, which has to be between uh, both global institutions that both lend and give money, national, philanthropic, local institutions, and stuff like that. Because unless we all work together, no change is going to happen. Thank you very much, Fila, for those insights. Um, our next question is for Nate. It comes from John Coonrod, who asks, how can I best link our network, which is the Movement for Community-Led Development, of 1,500 community-based organizations to what's being learned about resilience in GRP? Thanks. Uh, it's a good question. It's an easy one to answer. So on our website, and I'm sure somebody, um, Ido or other, will put up a, a link we have that's, I mentioned, the Resilience Knowledge Coalition. Um, it's the place where we're sharing information from across the partnership on how to apply, how to apply resilience, how to connect on it, how to measure it. Um, and we would love to have the, the movement for community-led development um, as part of that. Um, so that would be a great starting point there. And, uh, and I'm sure that will lead to, to more opportunities. Great, thank you so much, Nate. All right, here's a question for Jen. In your experience, what practical measures are the most valuable and effective in enabling locally led development? Wow, I think we need another webinar. Um, <laughs> I think um, this is, I don't mean to say this in a way that's, uh, that's evasive. I think it really comes down to trust in relationships. And so it, it's, a, it's about recommitment um, you know, avoiding the two-year project cycle that we've heard several people reference. Um, we need to meet communities where they are and um, let communities be the the drivers of of where our programming goes. And so, um, and I say let because as NGOs in the international space, I think we are used to taking that role. And and so. Um, I, as I said before, I think it, it may require sort of um, just as a principle, being open to the idea that the partnerships may not look like they've always looked before and that we need to recognize that we need all of the above. We need local private sector, which could mean women owned businesses and MSMEs. It could mean, you know, multinational off takers. We need local governments um, and we need uh, civil society at all levels, whether we're talking about local or international. Um, and so I think, you know, starting with that contextual idea in mind that no, it's not going to look the same in any different communities. It's got to be context, context driven, demand driven, and um, and recognizing that there may be a different risk profile than the one that we've all gotten kind of comfortable with, but but we need it, it is the direction we need to go because we can't continue to do the things we've been doing for a hundred years and think it's going to look different. Thank you very much, Jen. I hope that wasn't too vague for it to be a meaningful answer. Well, I think a lot of these webinars, they spark really wonderful conversations. So hopefully these discussions will continue far beyond the bounds of our time here today. Thank you so much. 
We have our final question for Shanaz. And the question is, over the next decade and apart from climate change, where do you see global partnerships making the biggest impact? Sure, that's, that's a big question, eh? Um, so I think the global partnerships particularly, so, so, so climate change will be the big one, but I also think, and there's a lot going on around gender-based violence, particularly if you, so, so, so this is now completely out of the climate change space, but, but often it is exacerbated by that. But I think partnerships are going to be, are, are going to be formed to address this and address it large scale. Because often it's seen as a localized issue, et cetera, but it's not. And, and so, so I think those will be north-south partners and south-south partnerships. It's going to be horizontal and vertical partnerships to address this big issue which I think is a huge issue for us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shanaz. Um, we're going to close the Q&A, but I do want to note there are still some wonderful questions that we did not get to. So the team is going to do a write-up to get um, answers to you for the questions that we weren't able to reach. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Nate for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. So it just um, leaves me with the, the, the pleasurable task to thank everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, USAID and, and Resilience Links. USAID has been a, a staunch supporter of GRP uh, for a number of years now and, and one of the founding partners of, of GRP, and, uh, and that support has been critical. Um, we're, a, we're a small team, but uh, we were really pleased with um, you know the work that the partners do and are really glad that we can help support our partners to to do their fantastic work thanks to USAID and and our other donors um, I'd also like to thank the panelists so of course uh, Jen Shanaz and Sheila uh, for a really rich discussion uh, it was fantastic and also thank uh, Michael especially for the opening uh, Sophie and yourself Samantha uh, so I hope we've um, we've started. You know, we've talked about global partnerships here. We had quite a few people tune in. I hope that this webinar also sparks the more uh, effective partnerships. So please do keep in touch. We've given you quite a lot of information in the chat, and uh, and we hope to hear from you uh, going forward. Thank you all. <laughs>